All right, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Stephan DW and I'm speaking to you from the Waterfront Museum Barge in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Uh, this is the Tide Shift Project. Uh, and the Tide Shift Project is uh, funded in part by Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for Humanities. Uh, what we're gonna do today is talk to some folks who uh, worked on the waterfront, uh, particularly uh, interested in talking to them about their memories of the years before the transition and during the transition to containerization, and talk about uh, uh, the, the experience of working in uh, freight and ship ha uh, freight handling and shipping uh, in New York Harbor. Uh, we have a very small invited audience with us today, given the um, health conditions uh, in uh, New York City right now, uh, and. Uh, uh, we'll have two guests uh, join us uh, today, and we will have two more programs in this series. Those uh, programs will be next year in the spring and summer, and we will be sure to keep you posted about that. Uh, live streaming today and production is provided by Turnstile Studio uh, with Andrew Gustafson uh, producing. And uh, we also want to thank the Waterfront Alliance and the Siemens Church Institute, who uh, contributed a lot to uh, making today possible. Uh, all right, so I think that covers all the uh, everyone we need to uh, thank. Of course, David Sharps here who runs the Waterfront Museum, and makes it possible. Uh, and uh, we'll have a couple of sounds from the audience joining us as well, so you know this is real. And uh, you may also hear tugboats going by uh, as uh, we're here a, a very warm day on the waterfront. But uh, I'll turn to our my guest here and uh, hear what you have to say for us. So, what would you tell us? Uh, your name and uh, where are you originally from and uh, what year you were born in, just to give us the <laughs> background, uh, give us uh, the, uh, the context for what we're talking about today. Yeah, my name is Jim McNamara. I grew up in Lyndhurst, New Jersey, which is a New York suburb, and I was born in 1942. So uh, how did you come to work on the waterfront? It's sort of a long story. Uh, my grandfather worked on the Lackawanna Railroad and he died. Uh, he fell in an ash pit. And in those days, uh, uh, there wasn't really too many benefits for the widows of, uh, of people who died on the railroads. So my mother, my grandmother got a job working in the laundry for the railroad. And uh, then when I came along in 1942, uh, every Monday was wash day and my grandmother had a pass on the, the railroad. So we used to take the train to New York and ride the ferry boat and then take a walk around the docks as a, and this kept me out of my mother's hair. So uh, I was fascinated with seeing the ships and the activity on the waterfront. And uh, then things evolved and uh, there was a museum. It was founded, I think in 1954 at the Siemens Church Institute. So I wound up helping out this old gentleman, Captain Cropley, who ran the museum. And, uh, and that continued all through my high school years. And uh, in my senior year in high school, he was saying, well, uh, what are you gonna do, Jimmy? And I said, well, you know, I'd love to go to sea. And he said, well, I could get you a job with sailing with United Fruit as an able-bodied seaman, pardon me, an ordinary seaman. But, just later that year, he said, well, just fill out this paper. It's, it was an application to New York State Maritime College at Fort Schuyler. So I wound up going there. So uh, that's, uh, and then I, my first ship was the Keystone State sailing in, in and out of Erie Basin, which is right around the corner. That was, it used to be called States Marine Isthmian Erie Basin. And uh, Erie Basin goes back to 1825 when the Erie Canal opened. That was a fleeting area for the, uh, the grain barges and the canal barges going to Columbia Street where they were loading uh, the grain on ships. So uh, I spent a lot of time here. And I also spent some time in the Todd Shipyard here, which uh, I think we have some other folks who worked at the Todd Shipyard but they were on the pier looking up at the ships or on the ships, whereas I was on the ships looking to come ashore and uh, visit some of the fine establishments that were across the street. So <laughs> where one could get a beer for 15 cents. Wow. How long did you work on ships then? About eight years. Uh, I wound up, uh, States Marine had worldwide services. 
So uh, looking to go up the ladder, I uh, wound up on an ammunition ship for three years going to Vietnam. And uh, you know, I was sailing as a relief captain when I came ashore in 1970 uh, in San Francisco. And I got a job at the National Cargo Bureau as a surveyor. And then as a surveyor in San Francisco, we're working on freight bulk ships. But as the Vietnam War wound down, I got transferred to first Sacramento, then Houston, Texas, and then Baltimore, Maryland. And I was in Baton Rouge for eight years. And we went back to Baltimore and uh, finally New York. Oh, also a couple of years in Houston, Texas. So uh, sort of bounced around quite a bit, but since around 1984, I've been here and I wound up marrying a girl I was dating at Fort Schuyler. That's my wow. wife, Connie. My first wife and current wife. So, <laughs> and then uh, what were you doing as a, uh, in, your, in your work with the Cargo Bureau? We were overseeing the proper loading of ships. And uh, every grain ship that uh, sails for an American port has to have a certificate that says that the cargo was loaded correctly and that the stability is in good order. So uh, we would be working on board the ships throughout the loading to make sure that the loading was proper and the ship was suitable for the cargo. So, so what sort of things did you look for in that? Well, it was just the cleanliness of the cargo hulls, the, the structural uh, integrity. Uh, occasionally, particularly in the Mississippi River, uh, the ships lost their anchors. So that would be something that would be reportable to the Coast Guard. And uh, sometimes you had an older ship that had three or four different names and the documentation wasn't proper. Uh, they had no insurance. Uh, so there were things that you just, you wanted to make sure that it was done correctly. And the lives of the seafarers were protected as well as the ship. Why <clears throat> were the uh, ships particularly prone to losing their anchors in the Mississippi? The mud of the Mississippi River. Uh, everyone knows about the mud. It's a, a tremendous suction. And uh, when even today, when we have hurricanes in the Mississippi, uh, crossing over the Mississippi River, ships will set themselves on the bottom. And the suction between the mud will keep the ship in place in addition to the anchors. So, uh, you know, because you wouldn't want to tie up to a wharf because the bits on the wharf could pull away. But as long as you sunk the ship in the mud of the Mississippi and kept the main deck above the top of the levee, you were fine. The ship wouldn't go anywhere. So you're watching loading of ships happen in a variety of places around the country in a period, well, you started in the 70s where we're still transitioning through containerization. Uh, what did you notice about uh, the uh, way that happened and the uh, were there regional differences between the, how and how the work was done? Uh, what did you notice about the uh, transition to containerization, how that was affecting the communities and the, the work that was happening around you? Well, the big thing was there were a lot fewer uh, seafarers on board the ships. And uh, by and large, the, the seafarers didn't have to have the same skills as the seafarers on the break bulk ships. Uh, when you look around this museum, you see a lot of blocks, which uh, uh, land folks will call a pulley, and you're constantly working with cargo gear and, uh, and moving hatch boards, whereas uh, on a, a 10,000 ton ship that I was on, uh, we had 46 people. And uh, we used to call them seafarers, or pardon me, seamen, but today in a politically correct world, they are now seafarers, not seamen, because approximately, I guess, I think it's about 25% of all seafarers are ladies today. So uh, that little bit has changed. But the injuries uh, on vessels like this, and as well as ships, was fantastic, uh, because there was so much done, you know, broken fingers, lost fingers. I mean, you folks who have worked, you know, on shipyards, you know, Injuries, uh, unbelievable. And when you think about, we used to load uh, cargo directly from barges such as this and discharge onto barges such as this. This used to be a sliding wooden door and of course here and they would come alongside and you have uh, this being a railroad barge, 
it was, I believe, railroad unions stayed on this barge, whereas ILA was on the ships. And people were loading 350 pound bags of coffee. And uh, so it was two, two guys usually moving a bag of coffee. And uh, you can imagine, you know, uh, Stefan fortunately picked a nice, pleasant day here in Brooklyn. Uh, the weather is lovely, you know, a light little breeze, you know, we're rocking very gently. However, were we sitting here perhaps on a January morning, uh, the pier would be covered with ice, the barges, uh, when you see the, 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 the side of the barge, you know, this, you have basically have a walkway about nine inches, 10 inches. And if you're going forward or aft to drop a line or pick up a line, tie up a tug, uh, and there's ice on the deck, uh, you, you've got problems. It, it's, a, it's a nasty job. And uh, so we had a lot of see, you know, people working on the barges that caught pneumonia in the wintertime or overcome by heat in the summertime. And the thought of having a hernia was not unknown in those days because of constant lifting and pushing and, and carrying. So. Uh, with the advent of the container ship, uh, the people's lives became much safer uh, because today so many people sit around behind a little computer here and this is the exercise they're getting. They're not lifting a 300 pound. Now it's uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is the big problem. <laughs> that's, that's only the checkers. Yeah. <laughs> that's only the checkers. That doesn't help the lashes. Yeah. When you're up on top of when you're four high, six high yeah. on deck, yeah. You're on top and you're splashing them back down in the winter time, covered in ice. Yeah, that, that's fun. a horrible job. Yeah. And uh, I mean, even surveying over in Fort Newark in the middle of winter, yeah. you know, the, the container doors are solid ice frozen. You chip it to, to, to inspect the cargo to make sure it's properly uh, documented and secured in the container. So yeah, I mean, it's a miserable job. When you mentioned checkers, I'm sure anybody who worked on the docks saw a little gadget like this. This is called a counter. So if you're counting coffee bags, you would sit by the door and count like this. And if you made a mistake, you push it this way and it subtracts one. So, but basically everybody who wasn't carrying a cargo book uh, was carrying a counter. And, uh, you know, the way of the waterfront was tough. And then in these coffee barges, uh, th there were a lot of hazardous cargo and smelly cargo. And then you'd be loading up the Hudson River, you'd be loading uh, bulk sulfur and the sulfur would come down a chute. Uh, we loaded bulk cargo over here and you know, uh, you'd be breathing all sorts of nasty stuff. Uh, Faraline used to bring in a lot of asbestos. Yeah. And now of course, we all know about asbestosis and you gents know better yeah. than anybody about, you know, if you're a pipe I fitter. A lot of dead friends. Yeah. Just pipe fitters. Yeah, we all do. Covering it early. Yeah. Boiling. On mates on ships when we discharge asbestos and, and cargo. The families of those people yeah. doing the work because they brought their laundry home. Right? That's right. And the wives and everything else ended up catching. So it was common to get the crew to go down and sleep up after the discharge of an asbestos cargo. Yeah. And uh, a number of my friends died of asbestosis yeah. from, you know, yeah, they were mates, but they were working in cargo holds with asbestos. And uh, then I had friends who worked on tankers. We frequently had tankers here. And when you're gas free in a ship at Todd's Basin or Bethlehem, uh, you know, you're breathing, you know, all these vapors from naphtha and benzene and all these nasty stuff. And Everything that you kill you breathe. Yeah. And, and people were not aware of it at the time. Uh, when you had a typical victory ship, uh, the hatches were very small. They were about one quarter of the beam and about one third the breadth of the, uh, the length of the cargo hold. Well, if you had forklifts working in the cargo spaces, uh, in the 1960s, they started with having a safety man come down with a little gas meter to see if, uh, you know, if the, the CO2 content was sufficient and the oxygen content. But quite frequently, the safety guy was working for the terminal. Yeah. And he might look the other way and say, well, it's borderline, uh, but 
you know, turn on a fan or something, uh, uh, it'll be better later on. So, uh, but it wasn't. And, uh, and what were these forklifts uh, running on? What was powering them? Uh, the gas or gas. diesel. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there was, uh, you know, up, up until the end of the brake well phase, uh, the occupation which had the most injury and death was the maritime industry next to coal miners. So it was, uh, it was a very hazardous job. And, uh, and then, of course, we needn't get into fires. But when you think about fires on the waterfront, very common. You know, the, the whole list of pier fires, the Luckenbach fire here on uh, the, the foot of 35th Street, uh, there was a fire. Uh, the pier was the largest pier in New York. It was a thousand foot long. And uh, this was in 1956. And they had blasting caps and fuses uh, in the center of the pier. And then there was uh, scrap rubber, cotton, turpentine, and all sorts of other flammables. And there was a, uh, they were doing some welding. And uh, a guy with an acetylene torch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They always blame yeah. the welders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you were a welder, so I can see that. <laughs> the whipping boy. I, yeah, I so, worked a lot of welders. Yeah. I well, wasn't a welder. Yeah. Say, but they always blame the welders. Whenever In any case, fire, that's what started welders. the fire. And since, since the fire was in the center of the pier, yes. so let's say and the pier is 5,000 foot long. All the people came and ran up to look, and then the explosion. You got it. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. The thousands of windows, about a two mile radius around the, the 30 strip, uh, 35th Street Pier yeah. was demolished. And you were and at the Siemens Church at this time, is that correct? I was at Fort Schuyler. They were at Fort Schuyler. So what do you remember personally about that event? Did, did you, you hear, hear it, about it, it at Fort Schuyler? It was all over the news. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, was, it, was, it was big stuff. Of course, it happened around the same time as the Andrea Doria Center. Right. And there was an accident with the American Hunter and the Queen Elizabeth just about that time. So th there was a lot of maritime news. And in those days, if people were concerned. There were so many people involved with the industry, you know, due to, I think we had something like 26 shipyards or boat yards around New York Harbor. You had the tremendous yard up at Federal in Kearney that, uh, that is no longer. Uh, the three Bethlehem yards, a couple of Todd's yards, Monty Marine, Bushy, uh, and it goes, the list goes on. And uh, the Navy yard. Yeah, and the Navy yard. Fire on the Constellation. Yeah. The, the, the aircraft carrier, yeah. 1962. Which was right after the airplane crashed in Brooklyn, yeah. right? So yeah. that, yeah, that was an oil time. spill on a hangar deck. Yeah. So, you know, everyone was far more aware. People used to think of New York as a seaport. And now, uh, you know, now we have these beautiful promenades and we have Ikea and we have all this wonderful stuff. Uh, we're very concerned about the environment. So industry has gone elsewhere. But we don't think of New York as a seaport. We think of Broadway the shows. West side. Yeah, the, whole west side. the west side, the, the east side, years. Brooklyn, New Jersey you know, Staten Island, uh, this was all heavy industrial. Uh, in World War II, I think we had something like 750 tugboats, just tugboats, and a, a thousand barges like this uh, in the harbor. You know, just about every pier had a couple of barges tied up. So it was, uh, it was a different world. And, and people, everybody knew somebody who either worked on ships or worked at shipyards or worked on the docks. Yeah. So the thought of walking down Court Street or Jerolomon Street with seeing a guy with a hook on his, his pants, uh, you know, it, it was very, very common. Did you uh, work with barges like this at all? Oh, yeah. What, yeah. Do, what do you remember about working with barges like this? Were there particular difficulties or advantages to that? Uh, the people who worked on the barges were all professionals and you didn't want to get in an argument with them because at the time I was 140 pounds and the average guy who worked on a barge 
had a little bit of meat on them. And, uh, and they were hardworking people. And their hours were very, very long. I mean, sometimes we would be a typical voyage into Erie Basin. We would come in from North Europe and we'd spend about a day or two discharging. And then we'd go over to Bayonne and start loading at the Navy Yard, at Mosby, uh, Bayonne Navy Base. Then we'd go to Brooklyn Army Terminal and we would, many barges would be alongside there. And, and, yeah. So, so it was Bayonne, Brooklyn, and then back to Erie Basin. And, uh, you know, this, uh, the Brooklyn Army Base was a fantastic. I, you know, I had never been in a facility like that. Uh, you know, the modern pier, it was a Cass Gilbert designed building. And I, I, I think uh, our friend here might have given tours down the Brooklyn Army Base. And uh, it, it's remarkable. Cass Gilbert was the same guy who built the Woolworth building and uh, 90 West Street and another of beautiful <coughs> buildings in New York. And uh, one time we were there, I was a third mate on this Keystone State and there was a US line C2 right tied up right behind us. And it was around 10.30 in the morning and I heard that tremendous crash and a lot of a, a continuing racket. And a bottle of acetylene gas was dropped from the US line ship and the cap was facing the harbor. So it was like a jet plane coming down the wharf. And you know, uh, with a little flame behind it. And it was knocking all, it was running in the railroad tracks, the inlaid railroad tracks on the wharf. Uh, just it acted as a guide for this acetylene bottle, which might weigh about 300 pounds. And uh, the, the bottle was about this tall. So I'm guessing it was, it was about that, but it wound up crashing in a colossal explosion in the truck. Usually the acetylene would push off like that because I don't know, yeah. oxygen bottles go off like a missile. Yeah. It's a steel balloon when you look over the end. Yeah. So I've seen them go. Yeah, we, we heard it was acetylene since there was fire coming from it. But I, I don't know. Acetylene bottle, I, one was, Burning one time and it stopped the whole job. Yeah. It kept yeah. going again. I went and threw it over. Whatever it was, it was quite memorable. And people were jumping out of the way or jumping off the dock, you know, into the water. And it destroyed a number of gangways. It destroyed a number of pallets of cargo. Uh, but yeah, but the point that the point that I'm making is, it was so common to have accidents and yeah. little explosions like and fires on the waterfront that the daily news under a higher pressure. Yeah, the daily news didn't cover it. Nobody covered no. it because accidents no. were common. So uh, that's a heck of a long answer to your simple question <laughs> about containers. Well, but, let me let me ask you maybe a harder question. Uh, what's uh, an early or maybe even the earliest memory you could come up with? Uh, about containers and when were you first aware of containers? Well, 1956, it was uh, Sealand had their first ship coming into Port Newark. And uh, I lived quite close to Port Newark. Uh, it was the gateway city. And I thought that was really an amazing thing. And it, in those years, uh, America was the exporter to the world. You know, when you saw the New York docks, you saw, uh, raw materials coming in. Uh, there was uh, hides, uh, there was uh, iron ore going up the river. Uh, it was raw materials for the most part. And I, many ships came back empty. You know, uh, the coffee was in bags. Uh, alumina was coming in. Salt was coming in, as it still does for the roads. But the ships would come in with maybe half a, half a cargo, but they'd all sail with full, full load and a deck cargo. And that was the big, you know, it's similar to what's going on with China today. China is importing all these raw materials and they're exporting finished materials. The largest exports from New York going to China are well, up, up until recently when they stopped it was uh, waste paper and aluminum scrap or metal scrap. 
uh, or plastic, shredded scraps, or shredded tires. And uh, so all the raw materials are going to China. So when you see a large container ship leaving from across the way, Fort Newark, uh, chances are if it's heading to China, you'll see a lot of red boot topping on the bottom of the ship. If it's coming from China, you'll see the main deck being a lot closer to the water and very little red boot topping. So, you know, it, it's basically a reverse situation from the 1950s. And, uh, and of course, uh, think of the military bases we had here and we were supplying military around the world. Uh, for over 20 years, we were shipping goods to Operation Desert Storm. So, you know, when you think of all the military tanks that were left in Afghanistan and the military vehicles, now Afghanistan has, the Taliban in Afghanistan has the fourth largest military in the world. And where did they get all their equipment? From the USA. So in any case, uh, you know, shipping had quite an impact. In 1964, when I started sailing, we used to carry containers on the deck of our great bulk ships. And uh, we had uh, regular flat deck barges or scows carrying the containers over to Erie Basin. And the ship was a C4. So she had two 40 ton uh, heavy lift cranes, which we rigged to carry, to lift the container and place, we could carry about 40 containers on deck. So, uh, so you just, had stretchers that uh, were uh, coming off the crane. Yeah. So we had slings. Yeah. And, uh, oh, slings, so okay. We could lift 20 foot containers. And so we had 20 foot containers. And one of the biggest commodities out of New York, these were American Express containers carrying horse meat from armor going to France and that for the restaurants of Paris. Now, when the French prepared the food, apparently it didn't taste like horse meat, but uh, it made us all scratch our heads because we were all thinking the French food was very, very classy and exotic and we weren't thinking horse meat. So in any case, that was uh, was States Marine in 1964. And each month we carried them we carried about 20 American Express containers, refrigerated containers, uh, going to uh, La Havre. So, so you were aware of uh, the IDLX in 1956. That was good oh, yeah. news. Yeah. The IDLX was actually, she was not a success. She and her two sister tankers, they were oil tankers. And they were converted with a, a, a spar deck to put these 35-foot containers on. And... Uh, but Coast Guard regulations say you can't carry dry cargo and oil at the same time. So in essence, but the ideal X for about a year or two paved the way for the converted C2s of Sealand, the Gateway City, the Fairland, uh, and with the four others. So it was a, an interesting time. You've made reference a couple of times to uh, the end of Breakable and did you have a sense of uh, you know, when that happened? It, was it, you know, was, was it very clear to you that oh, this is the end of break bulk, or is it something you look back on and it seemed to have slipped through your fingers? Or you know, how how did that transition? How was what was your awareness of that transition? Well, in, in 1970, it became very clear to me because States Marine in 1964, States Marine was the largest American flag uh, cargo ship line. And by 1970, uh, they were building four freight bulk cargo ships in Japan. And I was supposed to be the permanent chief bait relieving captain on the second ship. And they sold all four ships to Ned Lloyd. So that was like slap, slap in the face. This is the end of the break bulk days when States Marine realized they could not compete with uh, building new ships and raising the money to build the new ships and what to do with their 50 old World War II ships. Uh, so as a result, they quietly paid their bills and uh, invested in Korean real estate. So, <laughs> and my last trip was actually carrying egg fertilizer to Madras, India. And I came back to San Francisco 
a, a surveyor of the National Cargo Bureau, which the Cargo Bureau was an independent company that was founded by the US Coast Guard to assist with the proper loading of cargo. And this surveyor said to me, Jimmy, why are you staying on this ship, going to India on a ship without air conditioning in the summertime? Why not join the Cargo Bureau and be a surveyor? And you can wave goodbye to the ships as they sail to India. So I thought that was a great idea. So that was the reason I joined the Cargo Bureau. So when you joined the Cargo Bureau, uh, how long was it that you had break bulk to work with? Is, did that stop being a part of your, did you have break bulk to work with from the get-go? Oh, yeah. Did that Absolutely. stop being part of your job? Yeah, Liberty ships were still running uh, out of the US Gulf till about 1974. And uh, so, and even today, we don't call them break bulk, we call them project liners or project cargo. And in essence, that's break bulk. So uh, on these large ro roll on, roll off ships, you see the big automobile ships, Toyota painted on the side or whatever. And they carry a lot of great bulk cargo, but it's carried on flat racks. So it's like a, a low boy chassis with uh, about 15 wheels that's taken on and secured in place. So the cargo is not lifted per se, it's the flat rack is rolled on and then secured. So that's a pretty far cry from what brake bolt used to look like. Oh yeah. Yeah, so very few broken fingers these days. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, uh, are you, um open to taking some questions from the sure. audience at all. Uh, so folks who are uh, watching online, uh, you can use your chat function and uh, Andrew will pass your questions on here. Uh, folks who are here. Uh, you know the name of the Ford engineer for State Farm? Bucky Buchanan. That's Bucky Buchanan. Buchanan. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, he, he was the Ford engineer. I worked for... on the Keystone State, <laughs> the Chambers Marine. And I also did a job on the Evergreen State on me the day I died. Yeah, she was a C three. Yeah. yeah, well, the Keystone, the Wolverine, and the Hoosier State were were sister ships. They were C fours, and they were employed on the North Atlantic. Every Green State, we worked seven days around the clock, and it's not like around the clock you get a great feeling of health. You work the only time you stop until you leave. That's right. And yeah. if you want to see insane people, see them there for enough days without any. Seven days working straight loading that ship. Yeah. And not only you folks, but the people on the ships yeah. work those hours too, because we worked around the clock. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. You know, that, that it's, meant it's nothing. No fun. Working on ships is not a lot. Yeah. Especially once they did get into containerization and it stopped being, you know, like I said, four, five days before. Yeah. Now it's overnight. You what? had 12 hours to load, unload. The jobs done. What the economics was at that time was let's say a ship cost ten thousand dollars a day. If the cost of the overtime exceeded ten thousand dollars a day, you didn't pay it. If it was less than ten thousand dollars a day, you paid it. So, and that was for the, the, the shipboard force as well as the uh, the shore side. God forbid if you held up a ship. So, uh, God forbid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God forbid you held up. Yeah. Ship. You throw yourself in the fire. Yeah. yeah. That that's from the shore side. From yeah. the yeah. ship side, that was your last day on that ship. Yeah. You know. So nobody holds up a ship. So that's fine. So we've had a couple of contributions from folks that I hope we'll hear from very soon. Uh, and uh, uh, taking a, a turn behind the microphone. Uh, are there other folks who had questions for Jim or folks in the audience at all? No? Yeah. I don't know. What's the difference of those ratios in ships, the C4, C3? So, so uh, yeah, so the question is for uh, the size of the ship. In World War II, uh, the most common ship was a Liberty ship. And uh, for many years, we had the John Brown here in the port. And uh, uh, then they had victories. Uh, I'm a, the director of the Maritime Industry Museum at Fort Schuyler. I, uh, I've been involved up there for about 25 years. And uh, we have a large display about the John W. Brown at Fort Schuyler. And they have reunions every year, which are held at Fort Schuyler. So, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting, interesting deal. 
there were 2,710 Liberty ships built in World War II. And as the war was winding down in 1944, people realized that a Liberty ship was not ideal for minor trades. So as a result, they then built the Victory ships. And there were over 500 Victory ships built. And the Victory ship, I spent three years on one, called the Magnolia State. And they were beautiful cargo handling ships. Uh, they were simple ships and they were very easy to run and they did a great job and they could do 15 to 17 knots depending on what style of victory you had. Then in 1936, when the Merchant Marine Act was passed, uh, a C-1 ship was designed primarily for coastwise trade. So you had Alcoa uh, and Likes Line of New Orleans having many C-1 type ships. Then C-2 ships were a little bit bigger and a little bit faster. And US lines, the same company that had the SS United States and the America, they had 48 C2 cargo ships. And Farrow Line had about 15, Grace Line had about 15. And then there was the C3 ship, which was 493 feet in length. And I think there was about well, almost 200 of those built. And States Marine Isthmian, as in uh, Erie Basin, they had 24 uh, C3 freighters. Farrow Line had about eight. Likes Line on their long distance Far East runs had a number of them. Uh, American President Line on the Around the World run had about 10 or 12. Uh, American Mail out of Seattle had about 15. Uh, Pacific Far East Lines had about seven. So uh, Delta Line had a number. So uh, and then in 1952, along came the Mariner, which was 565 feet in length. She could do 21 knots. And up until a year or two ago, we had a couple of Mariners running. And uh, about four or five of them were converted into passenger ships. The Monterey, the Mariposa, the Atlantic, which used to run out of New York. She was built as a cargo ship in America. So those were the, the classes of the uh, the cargo ships that were built up until recently. So and now, of course, the container ships are just designated by size of how many containers. And the largest one today can have carry 24,000 containers. And when I think of my 10,000 ton ship with 46 people on board, you have a ship carrying 24,000 containers with 14 people on board. And when the ship is in the Far East, they have a riding crew come on of uh, shipboard professionals doing painting, or pardon me, it's not referred to as painting, it's coatings and maintenance. So, and there are very few moving parts because the hatch covers are all lift on, lift off. Uh, you don't have cargo gear to speak of. You don't have container frames. So you have an engine room, the, uh, the mates and the captain, they're basically, uh, watch standers or navigators, and uh, it's none of this standing on the bridge wing trying to get a sight with a sextant when it's not cloudy outside, you're using your GPS. So it's it's really a, an indif a different world today. So. Yeah, I believe we have a question from our virtual audience. Oh, my uh, Chris Andrew, did you have one? Uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to so, read it in the chat. So sure, I'll pull it up here. here. Sounds good. See, uh, so one question we have here is uh, where can we get more information on the docks in 1918? I presume he's talking about the docks of the city of New York. Yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, New York Public Library uh, has a very nice collection uh, for one. Uh, I believe the U.S. Oceanographic Office has a material on this. Uh, the the uh, library at uh, SUNY Maritime College, the Luce Library, has a number of publications that could address this. And there are a number of books. Uh, one is entitled To New York Waterfront. Uh, then in 1934, 
there was a WPA pro project and it was, I, I think it was titled the New York Waterfront of 1934. And uh, there are a number of other books also, but by going to the Kings Point or Fort Schuyler Library, uh, I, I think, and then an old road map uh, lists all the piers and frequently uh, lists the, the name of the company that owned them. The Bidino Railroad owned many uh, piers around New York, as well as the railroads. So, uh, another question from uh, uh, a gentleman in Seattle uh, was a surveyor a, uh, a union member? Depends on which company he worked for. Uh, if he was National Cargo Bureau, he was not a union member, but there are many surveyors who are union members. Also insurance companies will employ surveyors, and I don't believe many of them were union. Great. Uh, regarding shipping meat to France, how were those 20 foot containers refrigerated? They had a refrigeration unit within them, similar to what you see uh, on a Walmart truck today that's carrying food uh, or uh, a shop right truck. It's basically the same thing. It's a, a gen unit which, which runs on diesel or gasoline or can be plugged in. When these, uh, in 1964, uh, the units ran on, I believe, diesel, uh, but more recently, they, the, the container ships are fitted with plugs, and the plugs are plugged into a genset unit on board the ship. So you would have, uh, yeah. you'd have fuel, how, so where was the fuel for these uh, containers? Was it uh, in the unit or? In the unit. Wow. Okay. Uh, let's see. Many thanks to Jim for his time. Uh, finding the talk fascinating. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry, that's not a question. Uh -huh. Yep, no, I think that's it for questions online at the moment. Any other questions for folks here? Yes? Uh, which determinant of cost uh, with the jetty that goes out into the York Harbor? Do you know what went on there in the state? And I'll just repeat that for folks at home. So the question is about Bush Terminal Park, which we can almost see yeah. across Erie Basin from here, and what went on at Bush, what is now Bush Terminal Park. Uh, that was one of the busiest terminals in the, in the port area. Uh, many of, many had small tiers. I think the, was the Luckenbach's 35th Street here part of that complex? I. I'm not Probably sure. Was. Probably was. I think so. And I think that's by 41st to 43rd Street. Okay. And actually, Andrew may be able to chime in on this as well. Yes, 31st to 49. Yeah. So 31st to 49. I think that was the pier. And when, when the explosion, not only did it explode up, but it left a, a hole under the pier about 20 or 30 feet in the mud when the pier exploded. But you had a lot of ships coming from uh, Far East and Southeast Asia coming into uh, the Bush terminals, uh, bringing in a lot of raw material, a lot of, uh, there were cork, and there were a lot of like sticks that were uh, cinnamon and uh, a, a lot of raw material. Yeah. We'll, we'll hear Good more about that. Yeah. Laws, We'll, we'll hear more about those specific materials from the guys who handled them and saw them from the yeah. here. Uh, what there's was another question over here, yes. Yeah, I may have missed this earlier. And what and where is Erie Basin and where is Fort Schuyler? Okay. <laughs> uh, Erie Basin is, I would guess, about a thousand feet that way. It's uh, when you take Columbia Street to its southern end, Erie Basin would be on your right. It's called the breakwater. There were people fishing uh, there a couple of days ago. It's the yeah. uh, the pool of water that IKEA is on is Erie Basin. Yeah, and it was founded at, when they opened the Erie Canal in 1825. They needed a place to fleet the canal barges, so they they built what was called the breakwater, and there is still a little bridge about 20 foot wide on the southern end of Erie Basin. And that's where the canal barges were basically pulled out by mules and, and 
Uh, Stefan can do a little rhyme about that. And uh, having worked on the Erie Canal for a while, and then the Erie, the loaded grain barges would be taken around to the grain elevator and they would be discharged and loaded on ships. And then after the barges were empty, they, were, they would be fleeted there or collected until they could be towed back up onto the Great Lakes or to Buffalo. So, and Fort Schuyler is right under the Frog's Neck Bridge. And that was, uh, New York was a harbor that was surrounded with forts. Uh, Fort Hamilton, Fort Wadsworth, you know, there are there about 12 forts around the harbor. And at, uh, at Throg's Neck, there is Fort Schuyler. And across the water is Fort Totten. And supposedly the cannons could uh, hit every, any ship coming up. And the interesting thing about Fort Schuyler that was built around 1855 was at that time, uh, Robert E. Lee, a fellow who came from Virginia, was in charge of the Army Corps of Engineers. And supposedly, Ulysses Grant was on the scene building the fort. And what I have been told, it was the only time that General Lee and General Grant worked together on a project, and that was Fort Schuyler. And at Fort Schuyler in 1934, it became the New York State Maritime College. And there is a wonderful museum there, uh, sort of the largest in the New York area. Uh, that has a large collection of ship models and it's tied in with the, the loose library. Yes, it is. We've got uh, another, any other questions from uh, folks here? The Empire State ship, yes, working on landing repair and they were working on a big job on the Empire State. So uh, some men came, sent them out. I was in the office for the entire day, and I sent them, all right, going to the Empire State, a Spanish fellow, okay, it's all they were. And I get a phone call. Uh, I can't find the, the, the game. So why not? So did you go to the engine room? I'm in the engine room. And you can't find them? No, I've been all over the 30th floor. <laughs> <laughs> So the story about uh, mistaking the yeah. uh, Empire State ship for the Empire State building or vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is actually the sixth Empire State that yeah. I was on Empire State number four. Uh, currently, it's Empire State number six. That ship was built in 1962. And it's currently up at the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for an overhaul. But she made a 134 day cruise this past summer. And uh, with no engine problems. And interestingly enough, she is the only steamship that is registered in the Port of New York. When you think of how steam was such an important uh, thing here for the last century, and the Two last ship that is a steamship based in New York is the Empire State. We have another steamship that comes in here, oh, about once a month or so, called the Chemical Pioneer. And she had an interesting history. She was the sea witch, the CV sea witch at the painter ship. And she had the accident in a collision right under the Arizona oh, Bridge. I, I took the bell off. <laughs> when they it hit, there was a barge in between. So it looked like a, a jaw. Now we don't have a thief in the audience here. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> to make sure nobody stole the bell, I ah. went and took the bell off. And then ran into it again when it was out at uh, the Navy Guard when they were converting it. Yeah. And she rolled in the docks. Yeah. That ship is currently the Chemical Pioneer. Yeah. What they did was cut it just forward of the engine room at, down in Newport News, Virginia, and built an entire new uh, cargo section and bow, took the forward deck house, and put it on top of the old engine room. And it's now. Uh, one of the largest American chemical tankers. Uh, so she, there you go. So, so those are the two steamships that we see here. So when you think about what steam whistles used to sound like, not too many around these days. I always think of, remember the calendar with all the stacks? Yeah. Put out by banks. Yeah. 
Bank ship rigging. All of those. Yeah. And now it was a calendar with about 100 ships smokestacks. Uh, and most of the smokestacks were American flag owners. Unfortunately, wow. we have very few American flag owners today. You got it. Well, I'm sure we will find more opportunities to talk to you and catch more of your stories, but uh, I feel like we've come to a good stopping place for this Absolutely. one. And uh, we'll take a brief break here, let people stand up and uh, take a little walk around. We'll be back in about uh, five minutes with uh, another uh, set of stories uh, from the working waterfront. All right, welcome back. And uh, just to remind you, this is uh, uh, the Tide Shift Project at the Waterfront Museum. Uh, and this is a project funded in part by Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And uh, this is uh, on a live stream to all over the world, uh, provided by Turnstile Studio uh, with uh, Andrew Gustafson producing. And of course, we're here on the Lehigh Valley number 79 uh, barge built in 1914, operated by David Sharps and the Waterfront Museum. And um, yeah, so we're, we've been talking to folks who worked on the waterfront uh, about their experiences there and uh, capturing their stories. Uh, so uh, we'll begin again. Uh, would you please let us uh, tell us your name and uh, about the year you were born and where? And okay, my name is Robert Hansen, born in 1953, a fourth generation uh, docks and shipyard workers of New York City. I grew up on 40th Street, just across the street from the British Terminal Building. Uh, Bush General uh, Pierce right. in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. And how did you come to work on the waterfront? Oh, when you have four generations, great grandfather, grandfather, and father, I tagged along with them when I went to work. When I was old enough to drive, I used to take them down there. They did shape up work. So you would show up at the shipyard, at the shipyard, what the ship companies like Architectural Engineering, Gulf Marine, GM Diesel. Atlantic should be paired, which I currently work, but not currently, but worked for back then. And they hired you. Now you had riggers, burners, welders, outside and inside machinists, which is, I was outside with Buddy Cox. All right. And um, today, Buddy Cox is here. He was my foreman. So that's how you guys met. I reached out to him. All right. We have a lot of stories. <laughs> so I was, not a sailor, but I'm the guy, along with him, who fixed them. So when the ship came in, we fixed the booms, the hatch covers, the engines, deck work, anything on that ship, from anchors, anchor windlasses, propellers, holes, hatch covers, and aboard the ships back then, we worked on everything, from tankers to cargo ships, bulk containers, Light, light, light is above ship's hull for companies like Grace Lines, Mo McCormick, uh, Grand Columbiana Lines, Bush Terminal Lines, right, US Lines. We worked them all. So we're the guys who were called out to the ship to fix it so it could get on the way so it didn't stay in port. So we were under pressure to get there and fix it so it can get out of the port. But how, what was the first uh, job you remember doing on the waterfront? Um, well, I walked in to Atlantic Ship Repair. My father worked there. So did Buddy Cox. And I went up to see the owner directly. And uh, I asked him for a job. And he goes, you don't know anything. And I said, I've been hanging around with my father down the shipyard since I'm a kid. I'm really good with my hands. I'll show you what I can do. So he called downstairs. Some we go downstairs and start. I went downstairs. They introduced me. They always knew me as Hanson's kid. I met Buddy Cox. He left, <laughs> but he was a good teacher. And I did everything from drive a truck with the men to the ship to work on turbines and pumps, boilers, anchors, you name it. I did it. And I was a young kid. Broke my heart. I got hurt a number of times. I had my foot broken and smashed, hands broke, fell down gangways. It was a dangerous job, you know? But over those years, we worked with the cargo where the men had booms and they loaded the bags of coffee and crates into nets. And you had to watch where you're walking as you worked. 
and they loaded them onto the pier. They took them off by hand, stacked them up, and put them in a the pier and stacked them up. You didn't see coffee two stories high, you know, with bags. And the men would be on them with hooks, grabbing those 300 pound bags and throwing them. And the hooks were, they were like the hook that uh, Jim was showing us before? Yeah, exactly. And we would be on the pier. I would be unloading oxygen and saline bottles to the guys, putting the gauges on. They would run the hose down the engine rooms. I would go back and forth all day long with whatever they needed. Um, if they were shorthanded, they sent me down to work. So instead of just sitting in a, a truck, I went down there with my toolbox, used an old seat belt, cut off, and you tied it on the box and put it over your shoulder. You carry it up the deck and you're navigating your way down the engine room. So tablets all over the place. The heat down there is incredible. That's so salt, the salt tablets. Salt are, tablets. And so uh, how does that figure in? What because you would be sweating so bad. The temperature down there, 120, 160 degrees. Oil is still hot from the United States. We're trying to fix them. Sweat's running in your eyes. We have around the clock till the job is done. You don't leave. You don't go to a phone and call your mom up or my father or anybody else say, I'm not coming home tonight. Like buddy said, you're there till it's fixed, no matter what. In some cases, we even went with the ship while it was underway. We would come out of the engine room and be in the ocean. Yeah, where is, I'm in the middle of the Atlantic. And how, what would did that happen then? How would you get They'd home? They'd have to send a, an old, you go and tug to get us. We'd have to climb down the side of the ship and jump to a boat. Sometimes Coast Guard would come get us. And did you have your tools with you? Yeah. And so you had, you're doing, you're yeah, climbing and down. You'd have like a Spanish crew, German officers. They didn't know. They were taking wherever they were going. We didn't know where we were. And we ate raw fish heads, tomatoes for, in the galley. <laughs> Not everybody ate the fish heads, no. I gather. <laughs> they put a bowl of fish heads out and dry bread to eat. And we would be down there. You, you didn't get seasick. You, it was built into you. you you're like, on this thing, moving a little bit. You didn't get like that. You know? And uh, I was young, I was learning. And I, they, these guys here put me on everything imaginable. From being up on top of containers, putting hooks, lashing them down, to cutting chains being over ice encased over the anchor, the windlass, chopping it off with an axe and a torch, trying to melt it, put a brake on it. We did everything. Were containers already being used when you started working or did, was there a point that you were- They were there, they were there. And when we did a lot of conversions on some of these ships where they took the hatch covers off. And we, in that midpoint, there was still a lot of break ball ships. Yeah. Containers so they there was coming in. still a lot of break bulk when you yeah. started, but it was transitioning. Yeah, all the push piers, yeah. that yeah. was the way it was, break bulk. We went down there and they had the booms and have an operator. And he was swinging out, loading onto the pier. We'd have to be careful because you stepped over the cable. It could rip you in half. The break bulk ships always use warehouses. Yeah. With the cargo. When you have the container ships, that's what killed them. That's what killed the neighbor. Yeah. You don't need warehouses. Yeah. You need. I, I mean, if he could come up, yeah, yeah, buddy, me. come on up here. I'm going to step out oh, away. Yeah. And, yeah. Why don't you come and take my seat you here? You just need land. Yeah. Come, yeah. On, come on, buddy. I'll sit, I'll sit right no, there. sit on the camera. Uh, uh, we want you closer to the mic. We work together, actually. Yeah. I'm going to sit here behind the With computer. containers, you need land. You need places to put the containers, store them, and everything. You just need flat space. That's what made Port Elizabeth, Port North so well. They had them for a while at 39th Street. Aside from needing land, they also needed access to get to the highway with the, with the trucks and to get to the railway. They didn't have that here. They had the warehouses, which was great for brake water. But these neighborhoods died as we came to Started with Sea train where they put the train on top of the ship. But that was all that weight from the, the railroad cars. <clears throat> then they started with the containers and they had the cranes on the ship. And again, that, all that weight was lost. 
So they took the cranes off the ship and put them on the pier and just put cranes wherever they were going. And now not only could they stack them too high, now they were going six high. So it, it changed everything. Well, now, since you're up here, uh, yeah. can you tell us uh, how you got started? How old, when, when were you born? Yeah. And where I was, was born in 1948, uh, oh, oh, yeah. right over here at Corkin Street. And I ended up working because, well, they, they had me destined to work. I had, when I was a toddler, they had a toolbox ready for me for my father's friends. And right over there, where, uh, where it was White Rock Pier, they were converting a Navy ship and they were doing work on it. My father was handling the equipment on the pier, the generators and the boiler. And, the, and they had a freeze up, the pumps on the pier, and he couldn't get anybody. And they had a boiler with a bad hot weather trying to control the level of the water. So he came home and got me. I was eight years old, 56. And they took me down there in little speedy pajamas. And I never left. I used to go there all the time. I'd bring my father's lunch and stay there. And everybody was teaching me. Like I said, the pipe fitters were showing me how to thread pipe, how to bend pipe. Uh, the inside machinists were showing me how to Operate a I was everybody just uh, the welders and furnace. I used to use a torch and weld when I was nine. Uh, take pumps apart. They would go in and have a beer with my father. <laughs> and I would work on, on the pump. I would take it apart, take it, you know, take the rings off, and everything. Oh, a very good kids <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, they would they would sit there all day and have drink with him. They said, I don't drink. Drinking, I'm going to tell you, is something you have to inherit. My father didn't give any away. He kept it all to himself. Yeah. So, yeah, I knew his father. So, yeah. I worked with his father. Yeah. Me My and him. father was a very big man. Big guy. Yeah. Uh, most of the, you know, the size, you always figure these men I worked on side by side with his father. My father was very big. He built like a mule. He yeah. used to, a lot of times, on would have to gas up the machine these with a hand yeah. pump. He would take them off the truck like yeah. 50. He'd just take it off. His father taught me how to put the oxygen yeah. bottles on my shoulder. My father-in-law was a riveter. And he swing that riveting gun around on the bottom of the ship for a while. And so they were big moose. I took that for my mother. My mother was a hundred pounds soaking up. And she still ruled him. It, uh, it, most of them, you'd be surprised. Most of the women, it was poor matriarch. These men working on the ships, they were mistaken teenagers. Off they went, they'd stop at the bar and all of that. And the wives took care of everything. Yeah. And they made sure, you know, they, they brought their check home or they would die. Yeah. <laughs> that was true in your family. Yeah, no, so. And they were terrified of the wife. You know, they, they were all these big 260 pound men scared to death of a hundred pound woman. There was a saying on all of these bars, like John's right over here, the phone would ring and it would be, if that's my wife, I'm not here. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone would be the same thing. We climbed around like monkeys. In the engine room, me and him. When we had to hang a valve up there and a rig just, it was not too too small to hang up on a chain pole. Me and him climb up there and drag it up, hold I it in place. Very good teacher. I do. Yeah, we work together. I at that young age, I had these good teachers that but these old timers that knew the tricks. Yeah. And now we're old. When they came in, when they came in, the kids, they were relatively the same age. But they didn't know the tricks, and their parent didn't teach them, and it was no longer the apprenticeship program of the shipyards and that. So they had no way to learn. So you had to teach them. You had to take them by hand. See, buddy could do a little bit of everything. I, well, I could do everything learn, of everything. Rick, and I, I hung out with him all the time. He always put me with him. I could do everything of everything. You know, it's, it's a jack of all trades. No, yeah. I was 
proficient in all trades. That's yes. because I had started so young yeah. and I had these tremendous teachers. Well, he was a workaholic. He didn't stop. Well, that's every somebody, see, most guys no, shaped. No. He worked in Atlantic every day, yeah. all the time. He didn't have to. I, even when I first started, I, I, like you said, I, I was graduated, I was 16. And next couple of days, I turned 17. I went to work and it was shape up, but I, ne I never collected unemployment because yeah. as soon as I'd stop working someplace and finish up a job, the phone would be ringing and I'd work someplace yeah. else. And I ended up with the uh, boiler maker with Jeffords working steady there. And then, then I got drafted because you'd think I had enough sense to join the Navy or Naval Reserve, which I should have in high school, I would have if I had been old enough. But no, so I was taken in the Army. So where did they put me? Army Aviation. I was an instructor teaching helicopter pilots and fixed wing pilots how to fly on instruments on a flight simulator. So when that's over with, I came back and it's, well, why don't you go and do that? Because it's boring. It's just once you learn, once you learn to fly, it's like driving a car. You know, you say, you get the boom, tap into that. It's like driving, it's the same thing. You're flying a helicopter. Once you learn, it's repetition. You were telling me that the drafts had a really negative impact. Yeah, on a lot of guys wanted to come back. So there was a big gap between the old timers that he's talking about and our age. He, he's five years older than me, but there was a big, huge gap in that era. And a lot of them, they didn't want their children to work. Yeah. So it, it's brutal. It, the hours are brutal. The working conditions, you say, if you're working down in the hole, yeah. And in the summertime, in that, you couldn't keep a girlfriend. Yeah. You couldn't if you're working in a boiler. I worked on boilers with them. The ship came in, they threw planks in there and the, the corners were still red and you so went in hot. cutting out tubes so they plug them off and put glowing red sweat pouring off you cheap ass clothes you would be covered in soot and it would it yeah. would look bizarre coming out of there with this sweat the yeah soot. just soot and everything yeah. coming no. down i used to have to climb up there and we don't know what a special you would breathe as if you were breathing through a straw. Yeah. So you didn't break your lungs. Yeah. You break. Because if you too quick a breath, it yeah. burn your lungs. But by the same token, when something would screw up on deck, it would always be in the winter time. And steel is very cool. Yeah. yeah. Try touching it. It's, yeah. Yeah. Do you have roids? Lay sit down. Lay on the deck to try yeah. and. Freeze an anchor windlass and get it going. Oh, yeah, forget it. And you're using a torch and you can't even feel the torch. And it's this far from, from the cold. The hot grease would drip off and burn you. It was just heating it up. It would go on fire. I just stand there. It's with, unforgiving. Yeah. And did, if they're careless. And did containerization make it safer? And did that change the piece yeah, of Safer people? in a lot of ways. But at the same time, it, they wanted the speed. Yeah, when yeah. they brought in a brake bulk ship, they expected to be there four or five days with loading and unloading and storing. And that. With the containers, it went out. a lot faster. They wanted them in and out. Time is money. Got to hurt with the cables, the lashing them down. Said, You've got trucks flying all over the place. Guys got the hands crushed in pain and break and fall down. You were telling me uh, somebody's hand? His father got hurt. My father well, got hurt. Like, he was uh, working up on, on top of the container and they had the, the crane for it nearby. And they tripped it. And the guy, the guide on it for the container, fell down and his hand was there. And plus, it, you kept all different types of ships now. You not only had containerization. The you lighters. The lighters aboard the ship's hull. They pick up the whole barge and put it there. It's called the lash. L -A -S -H. They had yeah, but they had all different types. They had yeah. them, they had the so they're taking an entire barge and putting it on the ship. On a ship, yep. Okay. 
They were floating against in. turbine ships for sea trade. Yeah. And uh, it became to a point where we did a lot of sailing with the ships. Yeah. To do repairs and to do conversions. Like I had to reinstall to put an extra demister because the salt was just eating up the gas turbines. And had to build a frame to put an additional. So you had to sail with the ship. And yeah. had to well so we not only fixed them. But even when we took them out, like we worked on the Williamsburg, the mm. super tankers. All right. This is in the Brooklyn Navy. Yeah. 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 And it was, it was turned over to Coastal Which Dry Dock. It was a disaster. Yeah. That whole experiment when they had those ships. Yeah. They decided they were going to start training people and they were going to build these tankers in the old Navy Guard. And a few things they brought. Beautiful equipment. I, I wanted to try for this. Beautiful equipment. And nobody screened the people. Basically, they took the minorities. Doing. It, not just minorities. Oh, them in. Nobody wanted to. They brought women in who had no idea how to light a torch. They didn't. They nobody didn't was well. paying attention. No. There were so many accidents and people hurt because nobody was paying attention. How ridiculous yeah. it was. They had a crane. When it runs up and down the tracks, it has a bell, so they know enough to get out of the way. Yeah. The bell wasn't working, so the safety OSHA people said, okay, you have to have somebody there. So they hired a guy, and he was walking up and down with the crane. And he got drunk and fell over, and the crane went over. Yeah, a lot of guys are hurt. People are paying Ridiculous. attention. Ridiculous. Containers would fall on people. They would. They had riggers who couldn't tie knots. So now they're taking equipment by crane overhead, heavy steel, and bringing it over. And as you watch, everybody run because it's going to fall all yeah. over. You had containers the whole idea that were was properly, and they swung down, so took out the guys on the docks. So that, that went bye-bye. Those ships were badly built. And it took too long. And then all the small companies like Arthur Tickle and Atlantic. Atlantic. And we were sent there. All of them had, we had to go in and to fix what they messed up. And we made a lot of money. Yeah. Right. It, was just, it, was, it was a sin to watch all of that equipment being abused and not used. Yeah. We, we took it out for a sea trial. And we got out here by the Verrazano Bridge. This was the, the Brooklyn? Yeah. yeah. And the Bro Brooklyn and Williamsburg, and the smokestack had to be removed. So they because it, it couldn't under pass the, under. And right, the, uh, under the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, no, yeah. under the Verrazano Bridge. Verizano, yeah, it wouldn't wow. fit. Wouldn't fit. No, it would fit under the Verrazano Bridge. It wouldn't fit under the Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. The Brooklyn, Brooklyn. The Brooklyn but when we got out there, we had to put it back on because yeah. there was time coming in. They couldn't wait 30 days for the tide to drop. So I had to take it back off and put it on a barge, come and then put it back again. I worked the Hydro Atlantic, which was a ship that dredged up the sand that poured over on the west side, where they put all that stone from where they were taking out for the World Trade Center. And they, they dredged up all the sand from out by Coney Island and they <laughs> put it there and they ran back and forth. That's what they built that whole Battery Park City. Yep. And I had to do a couple of jobs on them to reline. The, the plant was like a World War II submarine, a diesel electric drive. And I had to go, nice, I had to go flying all over looking for submarines. That was it. Yeah. So it was nice going around touring, looking for submarines. A lot of strange jobs, and like I said, they, they would start changing the ships. They were trying to make the ship to fit. Like I said, the light. There was a lot of ships converted for containers. The hatch covers came off. Atlantic ship repair had to go in and put these guides in. All that right, was so for you the, put a container inside the ship. They, what happened? They had them all set for twenty foot containers, and they had to convert them for forty foot. Containers. Now a twenty foot container is not twenty foot. 19 feet, 10 and a half inches. And a 40 foot container is 40 foot. I know this because the first time I get a call and we had to go there, 
and the containers were stuck. Yeah, because nobody gave him that extra three inches. That was the clearance. And they couldn't get him to go down. <laughs> yeah, you cut him out. So and after that, go. I was the one who said, you know, what you're doing is, and told them what, I'm so I ended up having to do all of those conversions. <laughs> yeah. Supervisor and all of that. Yeah, he was my boss. Yeah. You know, we were down there and I would be climbing up and down through the hatch covers, I worked the boiler makers. I worked there. When I first started at 17, I was an outside machinist in Arthur Tickle. I was a, a rigger in Todd Shipyard. I was an outside machinist in Bush Terminal. I was a boiler maker over in Bethlehem Steel Hobo. <laughs> you know, it was my father had his thing. You know, man at home laying in bed, you don't get a job. You go to work. I never collected on a point. Even when I just started, did, yeah, I did a couple of times because I was much younger. What was that process? What happened was uh, you went down to the union hall and you got a stamp in your little union book. Remember that? And they gave you a little stamp and then you took your car or whatever. And some of the guys didn't have cars. You know, we helped each other out and we went downtown Brooklyn and you went into the unemployment building and you just stood on a line. You walked up to a window and you showed her the book. She stamped it and they gave you a check. If you're the supervisor, you want to be halfway decent. Yeah. I always demanded every work, they'll tell you. I didn't give anybody a break. You, were, you came to work, you worked. But if they had to go to work on a point, yeah, you, I put them off for a few hours. So some guys were not the cream of the crop. And some guys were, how do I say, hand selected because they were really good at what they did. I was lucky enough, I worked all the time. Sometimes my dad, because he, no, my dad was my dad here, but he was, he was a hard worker. But, yeah. he, but he, my father had a little bit of a mouth, you know, got him in trouble. So, but he used to drive me crazy. Yeah, he drove us, he would drive me crazy. He so, would try sometimes to be two of them. Yes. Yeah. And you want to try. One time we were working on a ship that was going to Asia and we sailed, we worked on it out the stream and we got finished and her felt so was there and then, and his father was there and he dozed off and fell asleep. And we were getting ready to go on the boat to catch the launch and come back. I said, Leave him. He'll be all right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we all, it was, I don't know if I would use the word fun. It was exciting. It, could be. it was different. It was different. different. That was the, even though I that was it. the selling point. It was Every different. day was different. Never boring. No. no. We it did everything miserably from hard. Boilers. It was three, four it's, days. The working, working conditions were horrible, but it was always a challenge. Yeah. To me, to me, it was. They gave me a bunch of guys, most of the time who didn't know anything, yeah. and said, "Do this. Just go fix it." Yeah. And we all had ideas in which ways we, you know, we all helped each other. And then it was like, oh, it's containerization. I think killed the whole area. Uh, you talked about, we were talking before, you talked about the uh, the, the camaraderie of yeah. uh, longshoremen. Yeah. Sure, the longshoremen and the ship guys who fixed them, yeah. us. We, everybody was friendly. Yeah. Everybody was Most friendly. Of the time. We had a camaraderie. If you're, I've also had times though where the longshoremen, you know, if you didn't work with them, like I said, the fellows at Howland Hook, Terrific. They they would go out of their way and do. But if you were trying to get in their way or screw them over, forget it. I watched them at Twenty uh, Third Street, Paul McCormick, yeah. where they kept the other company kept parking their van in the way, and they told them. So they just took the forklift and put it through the side of the van and picked it up and moved it over. Yeah, they were hard guys. Yeah, yeah you know, it was back then you had the long they, were, they were always the very good with me. I, I can't say a bad word about the long shoreman. They always talk about oh, you know, uh, the gangsters and all yeah. this. No, these guys worked hard. There's no fun being out there in February, like I said, being six containers high. The weather to stop where you have to put the. Uh, 
There was no and rain flashing down, no one rolling everything down, and then, and you had to keep moving. We would be so covered in ice. Or go out in the winter time when it's terrible, and go out when you're working out, out the stream on a tanker, and yeah. the tanker is empty, and you have to climb a Jacob's ladder to get up on the ship. Yeah, you know how high. <laughs> you're up there. Where, and where would you get your clothes? You're talking about being. Yeah, I went down to Kent Street. They gave us uniform. There was a place on Kent Street that gave you, they had like uh, these green shirts and pants. You paid a dollar each for. Or Frankel's Army Navy store on 40th Street and 3rd Avenue. It's no longer there, but the name is there. I, yeah. I didn't use that. I didn't use that for a couple of reasons. One, with a lot of times when I need to get something done and the burner wasn't proficient or he wasn't doing it. I would say, give me the torch and I would do it. So I wore dungarees because it's harder for the sparks to get through. Yeah. The you second thing, yeah. shirts like this, I always wore two. Okay. I yeah. wore a shirt and then I wore an outer shirt, even in the heat. Because I could keep my cigarettes out there. That, and when you get all the soot on when you're doing boiler work, Most of the fuel that they use for them in bunker C, it has a very high sulfur content. Now, when you get your perspiration and all that sulfur, it's at H2SO4, yeah. you know? You got a low grade sulfuric acid. Burns so it. after about three or four jobs, you take the cloth and just, it's like paper, it, it just tears. Yeah. So how often were you buying new clothes? A lot, a lot, yeah, a lot, because it would just fall apart. And then so, how do you wash that? You know, what, uh, you know, well, you have to say we don't have a washing machine. You know, so we either throw it out or we try to sneak it into like a uh, neighborhood like uh, laundromat. Did, you did bring it home. Yeah, you bring it home with the asbestos and everything on yeah. it, and you're killing your family. You didn't know that. You know, asbestos I mean, was safety gear. Yeah, asbestos gloves, asbestos. Sheets. Yeah, we had asbestos blankets. Yep. And we used to have and big rolls in the shop. They didn't tell us. They Cut it. It's powder, powdery, sticky, gooey. And I would carry it. Some of it I kept in my car. They knew that. Yeah. They knew that it was deadly, but we didn't. We didn't. I slept with that. I sent it like a blanket. A lot of men even repair it to or to patch up the asbestos on a boiler. Yeah. It's like doing work on it with the valve. You shipped it, it away. Fell to the floor. So I sent them there. He sent me up on the pipes, yeah. up above, and I have to straddle them. I had a homemade like chisel, and I'd break the asbestos off and it would fall. And then I would scrape it with a bar, because this way you can inspect the pipes when you work on a turbine. Yeah, a turbine. To be able to get at the bolt, you had to tear a large amount of all the flanges off. and chip it away so you got a wrench on it. It was all over your clothes, it was flying all over the engine room. Yep. We sweep it up. Like now, I use an inhaler. So, and I never smoked a cigarette because my lungs are full of it. But I don't have I had cancer. COPD. It's in my, it's in but, my lungs. Like I said, I smoked. Sorry, I had COPD. But I can count an awful lot of my relatives and friends who aren't here. Yeah. Because they were breathing all the time. You were exposed to not only asbestos, any sort of the chloride was big. And the cleaning Tylo. agents, anything, anything that was poisonous so that, that they could use in some form or another, you were exposed to. Yeah, I got sick one time from Tylo. Yeah. Tylo's a, an animal fat. Yeah. Yeah. And they used to ship it in tankers. And I had to go down there and clean it out. And I didn't know I was allergic to it. My body swelled up all over and broke out, bleeding from the ears and nose. When you're a very bad stuff. Of the tank that is. Galvanized. Yeah. Galvanized is the zinc coating. When you cut it, the flame and smoke from that, that if you want to be sick, try that. That's and we, we didn't, only the, the, the well that had a shield. Yeah. The, shield we didn't have shields. A shield so they're welded. The smoke. the smoke that would come up while you get blinded by it because he's welding right next to you. You know, you have to hold your hand like this. Okay, anyways. The, uh, 
a lot of times the welder would go and, and everybody would be getting flashed around, be, be getting flashed off the feet. Yeah. Yeah. Your eyes would get burn. Your eyes all burn. Would you do anything to protect yourselves from that? Or you hold your hand up like this, maybe? That's it. You Sometimes if you didn't get it real bad, it would use tea bags. Tea bags? Tea yeah, bags. burn your eyes. No, the tea bags, so and let them cool off. Damn. And something in the tea would help it. Help your eye, put it on your eye. You know, like they used to put potatoes on there or something to get the moisture. We put tea bags. Um, the best thing, like I said, these old time is on tea bags. Yeah. And that would help you. Sometimes you couldn't go to work because you couldn't see. It was like yeah. sand in your eye. So it's from, yeah, from, from a flare. Yeah, they always assigned me this old guy, Artie, who ate cigars. <laughs> he, he, yeah, he used to take the cigar out of his pocket, rip it off, and eat it. So once he swallow it, a wonderful welder. Yeah, but slow, deathly slow. You don't know how many times I said, "Go take a break, guy." So I <laughs> yeah. do it. Yeah. I want to go home someday. Yeah, and he wore his spats. Yeah, yeah. this is even in the seventies. He's wearing his spats. He was an old welder, slow. Was yeah. he eating tobacco just to have it, or was that? Yeah, no, he, he would just chewed cigars. He would, he would eat cigars with tobacco. He would, not like chewing tobacco. He would take a cigar, rip it off with his teeth. It would drip down when his you face. Get ready to tack something. You would say you were getting ready. Okay, you're gonna tack it here, and he would go here, and you go, okay, Artie, tack it, tack it, tack it, and then you turn back, and that's when it hit every. Every time I would be sitting next to him, and, he, 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 and when he got done with the tobacco, he'd swallow it. That's why he used to. Oh, he would, and he would spit out on me. My do me a favor. He was certified welder. Good welder. Yeah. All right, give me a second. Go take a break. <laughs> you look tired. Go take a break. Give me the torch. Yeah. <laughs> give me the shield. Give me, give me the wire. We would have big nuts oh. this big. Ooh. Giant nuts. Right? A shaft alley to propel them. And we would have to put these big wrenches on there, tie them down with a rope, and guys would tighten them up with sledgehammers. And the shift slightly turns on the propeller. It goes, and you work your way around it all day, all night. I was very fortunate in that the old timers taught me a lot of tricks, a lot of things that they weren't you know, the advantage. Of, younger guys know. That you had to tell them, you had to teach them. Like I said, baby feed them right along. Well, there was nobody how to take off spot. How to even just how to take the bolting off a valve. So, what did you think when he first showed up to work? When they first showed up. When, when he first showed up. Yeah. It was uh, another one. Yeah. I guess it, it wasn't the only one. But he'd been I hanging had, around for a while. Yeah. He? His, yeah, he was his father's son. So it's him, Frankie Deegan. Yeah. Another uh, Frankie Deegan. A lot of us came to be a burner. But they didn't know how to light the torch. It's, all right, I had to teach him how to teach because there was no training. Yeah, somebody had no, no start training, training at all. Tell them, and like they I gave said, you a union book to say journeyman machinist on it. If they tell them, okay, take that valve, take it here, they would just start loosening bolts. You tell them, that. always open the ones in back away from you yeah. because the if there's church. any steam in there, it's going to blow out that way. You, know, you got burnt. You had to teach. I got burnt from different. That was different. I got burnt because I was setting the safeties and it didn't pop off. And the port engineer, says, all right, it's all set. Sorry, it didn't down. pop off. What do you mean? It's a, it's a safety Steve valve. Safety. Oh, okay. It's not like a relief valve. A normal relief valve. The pressure reaches a certain pressure and then it pops and goes right back. A uh, safety valve is designed so that it pops and then it's designed with the shape so that you get a reaction effect. So where it stays open until it the pressure drops, drops back and it goes too hard. It didn't pop. So I said, okay, now I've got to change this. I got to lower it down. Oh, okay, lower, lower the pressure. I came down, stupid mistake. I should have went down because I knew this port engineer was. But I was tired. It had been three days. I said, okay, is the pressure down? And he said, yes. I went, I climbed up and I just went to 
touch it and I could feel a shadow in the valve. And off it went. It's 900 pound steam. Uh, even as the atmosphere flying, I got burnt. My chest, my back, my face, everything, second or third degree. I came at it in a fury because I said, wait a minute, the pressure was supposed to be down. Nobody was there. They had gone to the machine shop because it was cool. And nobody, they cut the flames, but that it was still climbing over the bricks. And it popped off. And I, would, I, got I was there. He got me. And he said, knowing him, I should have. I should have had enough sense to go down and check myself. So word came sure back to the down. shop. He got burnt down there on the steam valve. And we panicked, looked out. Is he all right? Because he could kill you. Yeah, yeah. Literally kill you. How, uh, how long were you recovering from that? Oh, I think five months. And, and I'm very fair. I know. Yeah. Just, like I, I said, you have to be careful. And, and instinct of being careless, and you can get really hurt. The one thing that can be really dead working with him it was one cold winter night. We were working on an ankle windlass, it was encrusted in ice. We put a brake shoe on, and we worked all day, all night on this thing. And when we were done, I took him home. Sure. All right, I drove him home in his old 1966 Dodge pickup truck, four doors that did, you couldn't get it to go over 40 miles an hour, but it was beat up, an old army truck. And I took him home, he lived right over here and the streets are desolate. Just my luck, having all that time yeah. and all the teaching, all the yeah. knowledge. A lot of times you would be working jobs where it would be so many days around the clock, they would change crews, but I wouldn't change. Yeah, we went I would three, be four days straight. Five days straight, but I would be the guy. They would go home, and another crew would come in, and I'd, I'd be there. His and boss, our boss, Eddie Ingram, said, Work all you want. You can work 160 hours a week, you can. But I didn't get the full pay like the other guy I said, because I was still like an apprentice. So I would work 100 hours a week, 150 hours a week, sleep in the truck, close your eyes, and lean on a bulkhead. I couldn't, five went, minutes. Went on to college when I got out of high school. Like I said, I was 16. I just turned 17 a few days afterwards, and I went to work. And I was getting full mechanics pay at that age. What, when, what year and what day was that? That was 1965. Remember what the pay was? Uh, I think it was somewhere around $10 an hour or something. But listen, I was, I had, Money pouring out of my ears. I got 90 cents. A single hour. guy with that because I was a mechanic. 90 cents an machine. hour as an apprentice. He said, I was a machinist. Yeah. I was a boiler maker. I was, yeah, I wanted to work my way, up, my way up to the union wage of 597. Now, him as a supervisor got 10. As a supervisor, I ended up, I was getting my 1200 a week. Yeah. And that, but I earned it. I still have my paycheck <laughs> stuff from the last repair $37 a week. I earned it. I Imagine that trying to kill yourself my hour. over thirty-seven dollars a week. And I, was the, I still have the receipts. Smartest kid on the block. Did you and feel like you could cover your bills? My body is erect. The I bar? have herniated discs all through my back. A, a mug of beer was a nickel. A everything was everything hurts. hurts. There is not one day that I get up where it is an aches and pains, like yeah. trying to move cement. I've had broken feet there, hands there. Got hurt. Mm -hmm. He remembers when I went down the gangway and he came back. He gets hurt. He comes back. He's yelling for his accident home. They weren't, he was careless. He comes back the first day we were in Great Columbiana. I'm standing there and he's coming down the ladder. And he came down at a right zoom. And he comes sliding across the deck. <laughs> The first day back, yeah. one day. I didn't just go home with that. I wasn't hurt. But, but he you know. came, he was he was the driver. I'll tell you a story with him. He was the driver. And they had a big Dodge van, long one. Had a terrible turning. I was sitting in the passenger seat. 
Bell because I was a supervisor. And we had a bunch of men in there all crowded in and they had benches on the side. So they were sitting sideways. And he come down the block <laughs> and he decides he's gonna make a U-turn to pull it in front of the, the shop. He's speeding to begin with. He makes the U-turn and then he realizes he's he's going to hit the car and he slams on the brakes and all these guys come to he had to jump out of the van and run in the shops and they were going to kill him <laughs> yeah that was a wild kid you know yeah he, just he a was. wild kid he was he was they told me to do yeah. something i would we would open the van doors the men would get inside mm -hmm. and i would load it full of oxygen bottles with the men in there yeah so i lifted the bottle up carried it from the all the way back that big bottle on my shoulder of 17 years old, and I would drop it into the van and then slide it forward and they they lift their feet up. And we rode with a van with like six or seven bottles in it with it 10 or 15 men. Watch. A lot of times they would hire the sons of the port engineer or somebody yeah. connected, you know, important them, guys to give them jobs. To give them a job while they were home from school. <laughs> And I used to refuse to take them on the ship because I'm not telling anybody's mother that their son is dead. So I said, no, I'm not taking them on the ship. You want to keep them in the shop? I don't want them near me. So they used to make them drive this. Yeah. So I had a bunch of hatch covers on the pier and I had a lot of hot gangs there. And I'm telling a foreman what to do. And he drives up with a truck full of oxygen in the settlement. He says, where do you want it? And I said, over here. And I turned around and I'm telling a foreman. And next thing I know, I get hit by an acetylene bomb. And I would have been there if it would have hit me in the head, in the shoulder. It spun me. And I ended up walking funny. I ended up having to have my back operated on. Yeah. My neck, I've got herniated this, my neck all the way down. Those kids used to read comic books. Kid, yeah, comic books. He's going to, he was talking about the Empire State. Yeah. They're driving. I get a call on the thing. I was running the shop and I'm there. And I get a call. It says, the machine's no good. What's the matter with it? It won't turn over. Oh, no. It, no I asked him, does it turn over? And he said, yeah, it turned over. Okay. I found out he was speeding along the highway and it went turning over. All right. He rolled it about four times. And had, their, the and terminology then, of what we consider turning over, like you say, someone, if you have, does the car start? No. Uh, does it crank over? They don't know what that had, means. Watch, like I said, even the language difference between Empire State yep, yep. and yep. the 30th floor. <laughs> Yo, we have starboard port. <laughs> wanted to. After four, they didn't know they would get lost on the ship for hours. Help me, we don't know where we are. Said, you needed a number of people who knew what they were doing. And then the rest, we needed bodies who were willing to work. And they would, sometimes they would drive me crazy. The early 70s, the Vietnam era, where it was like, it's heyday, 71, two, three, four, like that, in that area. We had a real bad shortage of all the guys. And it was either the old drinking, guys or the wacky weed. Yeah, and you they had to they watch. Too old. They'd get themselves or killed. Too young to have experience. So it was bad, you know. And I was neither. I wasn't too old, and I had the experience. So they worked me. I was the death. I was the mule. You know? I was the and gopher. I, and I was going to say you did a lot of work as a as an errand boy. Yeah. 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 How, how did that happen? Was that well, when you were seventeen? You were still doing yeah, that. Yeah, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. I worked ten years. Okay. All right. And what happened was, I even though I had my father there, my grandfather there, I really didn't know I mean, how to take a valve in and out. I know how to use wrenches, but I really didn't know. But because I had a, a lot of energy, I was wild. I drove fast and got things done. They depended on me to get the guys to work, go back to the shop, bring back measurements, run around to the different other shops and get plates and parts, get back to the shop, 
bring it down to these guys, then help them and stay there till it was done. So while well, they were there taking it out during the day and I was running around, you would need, when the job would finish, you wanted to help quick, you want to get out of there, just to pull up the welding table, and yep. hose and trap everything. So I learned a lot. You pull up the cables, fuel up the welding machines, yeah. bring the guys welding rods, go get them their nuts and bolts, get down the right wrench. I would scavenge it like the guy right on, on mesh. I would go get things. I would go to 160 Jerome machine and get the hookers and bring them down to the, the engineers and the captain on a ship for the weekend. And they would tell you what they wanted to do. Yeah. So I, my boss was somebody down at 160 Jerome Street, right by across from Supreme Court. I would walk in, go up the stairs, open a glass door that was like kind of like, and you can't see through the glass, like smoke glass, open up. And I would pick up two Chinese girls, two Hispanic girls, two white girls, put them in the boss's station wagon, take them down to the pier and give them, yeah, here you go, for the weekend. And this for the sailors. No, no. For the captain, the engineer, the oh, port engineer. The wheels. I got you. I wasn't part of that. Yeah, that I, click. I was, I was work. Yeah. I was the one that had to get everything done. <laughs> yeah. And then I would go back on Thursdays. I brought the paychecks down to them. They would sign them. I took them up the night street up to the bank. I would yeah. go there with generally a gopher. Yeah, gopher. I would cash all their checks, go back down the ship and go to each one, give them their money. Whoever owed the loan shop, the money came out. What, what you would try to do is whatever you got personnel wise, you would try to feel it out, see what talents they did have, what they could adapt to, what you could teach them. And you would stick them there. You know, you didn't want to overtax because, but believe me, on the majority of them, the uh, capacity to learn was not there. <laughs> See, for me, you I know, could earn. There were some times where I went, it was like, I used to say, I would go on these jobs and I would play Bo Jess. Remember the movie Bo Jess? Yeah. I would put the dead body, up with the guns, and I would run around doing a lot of work. And that was, that was my life. That yeah, like five o'clock would come and I would say, you got me for the rest of the night. What do you want me to do? And he would say, go do this and go do that. You knew you were in trouble when you would, they would hire somebody and he would come and it would be 8.30 in the morning and he'd say, what time were we working till? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know he's looking to leave right now. I used to tell him, you don't want to work at home. When you yeah. come? We had no pages, no cell phones, nothing invented. There's no telephone on the pier. Anyway. You no, know, when they you went to a, work, you went to work. And when you came at home, that time, they, put a, they wanted to get a beeper. And I told them, if you do, I will single it and right for you. Because yeah. that you're not putting a leash on me. Yeah. It was bad enough. I had a telephone at home. Yeah. Because it rang all the time. Yeah. I, got, I went on vacation. I didn't make it to the Verrazano Bridge. And they were calling me. You know, they were, you got to come back. It's an emergency. We uh, really didn't have a life. You know? Yeah, what, what did you do for fun? How did you relax? I had my family. I used to take my son to comic book conventions and my daughters and that week. Saturdays, I would always take them to the movies. They had one live action and one cartoon on the AWN. And I would, you know, I would take, I had the kids. I would go to museums. I love museums. Uh, I rode my motorcycle. I went once. I went to the Museum of Natural History. I took them for the day, and we went, and they had a good time. So I said, "You know what? If I go home, they're going to get me. So let's keep going." We went to uh, Franklin Institute. Oh wow! And we went there for a couple of days, and then I said, "Let's keep going." We went to the Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah. As long as I could stay away, because if day or night, if I was around. I was getting phone calls. You gotta help me. You gotta come right away. Sounds like you had a work life balance. You had your motorcycle. Yeah, I rode a bike. Cars. And I hung out with a bunch of bikers in Brooklyn. I didn't drink. I didn't I gamble. drank up. I drank at night. I, I was a family. bouncer in the bar. All the Hells Angels were lined up outside. I was a bouncer. And I had a gun in my waist, a meat cleaver, that kind of stuff. I worked as a bouncer for like 30 years. What were some of the bars where you uh, Poverty's Pub? Um, and then a fish park. 
Uh, I worked at Studio 54. I worked at Hellfire and s and Club. I worked uh, Empty Pockets, Wavelengths. It was a bouncer. You know? And when we went to work, me and I went to work over there, I pulled my bike up on the sidewalk, carried a gun in my waist, a meat cleaver in my back pocket, and a hammer. You're telling me about a place called Moms, was it? Where? Moms or mothers over that bar? Over oh, right? Moms Bar and Grill. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you look at the face he made. You, you know the names of these places. Believe me. Some, the Red Hook Pub right down here. Yeah. That's gone. I right think. at the end of Columbia Street, there was a bar there. And now the ship, I got a call, go down there. The generator had lost the orbit and it twisted the shaft. I mean, like a pretzel, steel, like this. Okay, where they're all over in the bar. I go over there, walk over there, and they're in there already. Oh my god! Yeah, he didn't drink this. I don't drink this. And this was a zoo. And number one, the the, the barmaid is a transvestite who's trying to hit up the George Lang. Oh my god! The and uh, he, he's telling her you'll never be the woman your father was yeah, and yeah, yeah. all of these guys are there and this hook is all over the place and i said get out of here the job you know <laughs> you got to drag them out to bring them back to the job yeah it was, uh, mom's bar had a little back room mm -hmm. a window in it and you went there with your paycheck and you saw, slid it through, and you, you paid a lot of money to get your check cash, you know? So you slid it through the window, and they put your money back out. And they had a little kitchen with some slop food. And it wasn't just a quarter of the meal. I was, I traveled a lot, flying, sailing with the ship, uh, all the ports, Venezuela, I Puerto Rico, all the places, Texas. You know, up and down the coast, up above water. It's crazy. <laughs> Anytime it was around ships, it was like degenerate sick. <laughs> There's no other way to explain it. Down here, uh, it was bad at night. And when you, you down by Coffee Park, you had all the hookers. Right here. Right here. One night, I jumped right here where John Paul was. We now call Sunny. Yeah. 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 They were working on a victory ship right here. And doing a boiler job. I was in the service. I came home on leave. Every time I came home on leave, I worked because I could make a bunch of money. And the guy just came up and he says, Anybody want to go? They got working in the car right over here. Number one, not my thing. <laughs> not my thing. I, it's in, in Atlantic. Yeah. I told them with some of this, I would, I would rather slam it in a car door. <laughs> than, no. You had to see, you had to, it was I, crazy. I named one Dracula's daughter because this was pale, maybe a hundred pounds, like three teeth. This is way one before on top, HIV or AIDS. Yeah. And uh, no, it was getting near that time and they would go. Come on, you want to go? No. Oh, I don't want to go. You know, it was... I saw it all because I no. he was in the ship working all the time, but I was going back and forth. I would I, be driving down here at night. I didn't and need. I didn't need. What I see down here. Morning. Sometimes I would go and see what's that? Oh, it's a dead body. You know, that coffee park was dangerous back then. Over there by Gold Marine Diesel used to be on the end. That whole area was really bad. Yeah. Let me bring it back to containers for a yeah. second. Yeah, uh, go back. So, same back. question as Jim. Uh, was there a point where you realized that was the end of break pull? Where it, yeah, it, okay. it didn't happen overnight, and there wasn't any you know dividing. Like I said, it started. You could see it happening. Sea train on. with the trains, and then with the container ships coming, and then, but you could see where the. The ships were moving away from here and going to Port Elizabeth Port yep. because they needed that open ground. Yeah. And there was no you can't work. work. You can't work a container ship here back then because it's all these. I blame uh, I blamed it on containers. The Just warehouses, then it had to move over there. 
And what didn't help was guaranteed wages. And it needed, it needed access to the highway. It needed access to the railroad. Yep. Uh, but that was a, the guaranteed wages. Yeah, well, Longshoreman got down guaranteed wages. That was a mistake. Yeah. That guaranteed wage, the bad part about it was good in a way because they deserved it for Longshoreman. But they had this thing where they could turn down three three refusals, and they did. What, sorry, what does that mean? Three refusals. They could well, well, take this job. No, I don't want that. Gotcha, I don't yeah. want so it ended up that we're always having to hire other people, and you had some, they never worked again. They were driving the cab service. They had a, they opened a store, they did, but they were just collecting the guarantee, and they never worked. Yeah. And who pays for that? And the price went way up. The poor so, price of putting a ship in the All of a sudden, a lot of them said, you know, why bring it into New York at all? Get away from New York. You know, go to Jersey. It got to the point where they would rather bring it in California and piggyback them on the railroad and bring it all the way across the continent the than to bring fees. it here and pay this extra money all the way through. The fees came up because you had a bunch of people who were adding to the lower the, yeah, uh, right. the And they weren't back. working. And the ship wasn't going to, let's say the ship paid 10 grand a day, make the leave a price. And it went up to 30. They're not going to pay that. So they these guys have everything. guaranteed wages. So they found somewhere else to go. When you're in New Jersey, when you're hiring 10 people working, you're paying 40. So the whole industry died, collapsed here. Between the it was containers and guaranteed wages. That. It was collapsing before that. Yeah. The uh, America gave shipping away. At the end of the Second World War, we owned the world. All the ships were American ships. Everything was American ships. There was no other country that had anything. Yeah. Uh, we rebuilt the Japanese automobile industry. We rebuilt the German automobile industry. Yeah. And, we built, and when our automobile industry said, can you help us out? We told no, we can't do You look around here now, all the factories and, and that was it. I'll tell you a story. U.S. lines decided that they wanted to build some round-the-world ships. And they went to the United States government and they said, give us a loan so we can build these ships. Okay. Government said no. So McLean went to Korea. Malcolm McLean knew. Yes. Yeah. And Korea said, sure, we'll, we will. And they built the shipyard and they built, they did terrible work. The ships were terribly built. You've seen them sitting over the west side there if you want. But badly built ships and everything. But all the money that they got, the Koreans lent them to build it, they got off the United States. So we paid for them to go to work rather than putting our people to work. I uh, want to uh, want to continue this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think we have a lot more to talk about, but I also want to give uh, folks a chance if, if you're cool with people asking some questions. Go ahead. Right. And do we have anything from the virtual audience yet? Um, yeah, we did have a question. If you could explain the difference between an inside machinist and an outside. An inside machinist would go and work on the turbines on the ship, or the, the valves. The, pumps, the, the old machinery. But an inside machinist yeah. would be on a lane and that in the shop, milling machine and all that, doing machine work that way, in shop work. Inside was in the actual company yeah. that didn't go out on the ship at all. Outside guys like me and him, we went aboard the ship and did the work on the ship. Yeah. All right, and if we could get it all done without going back to the shop. That's exactly what we did. In some cases, we had to take the part out, me like the driver, took it back, gave it to the inside guys. They would rebuild it, weld it, do whatever they had to do. And then I would bring it back and us would put it back. So the ship could go on the way. So there was a difference inside and outside. Great, thank you. Anything else from the virtual? Anybody here? Okay. How long was your apprenticeship for before you came school? It was supposed to be a year. Quote a year, but it was more like five years. Five years. 
Yes. So this is your apprenticeship. Yeah. See, I was, I was. Do a different union than the longshoremen. I yes. It's called the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 1972. You were dealing with the repair companies. Were dealing with a few unions: the ILA, the Machinist Union, and the Iron Workers. So you had to really, like, as a supervisor, and put up with all of them. Oh, and as and the IAM, you really got to do everybody's job mm. because a rigger can only pick it up. He didn't know where to put it. You know what I mean? So he could lift it up for you, but he really needed you to tell him where it was going to go, and you had to get up there and help move it. All right. A well that could weld something for you once you got it in place. So you kind of did it all. So the outside machinist was a little bit more talented in a different kind of way because he could do anything like Buddy here, whether it was a winch, a pump, a turbine, a diesel engine, a boiler, deck work. We did it all. And I learned from him. I mean, all the years of work that he did, I had to play catch up because I had to be around him all the time. So you would see him. It was, it was not only, there was a, quite a few of them. Yeah. They came, like I said, you just picked up the people that they gave you and you had hands. You might have a guy for three days and see You had to see if you were dealing with a vegetable or you had somebody who could, you know. Some guy showed up with a book. Yeah, he went to work. Some you people see couldn't follow year. instructions, you know, yeah. at all. And you had to watch them like a hawk. Like I said, you played OJ. Oh, the industry is all a there. male dominated industry. We like it back. I never saw a female there. I did. We had female welders. Yeah, but that was in Coastal Dry Dock. Where was that? In Ardell at Atlantic Repair. I never saw Over that. on US lines. We had female yeah. welders. Yeah, I, I never saw I was the supervisor. Was what was that? Excuse me. That was probably around eighty-two. Oh, okay, I worked throughout the seventies, so yeah, that would be the original. Right. Yeah. Were well, there are other questions from Matt? Uh, yeah. What would you say was the part that you enjoyed the most about working on the ship? For me, it was the challenges. You know, they did. They gave you problems, and I was a problem solver. You know, they would hand me a repair list. And a lot of times they would say uh, uh, things like, "Just go." And do it. they would just let me go and do it. The port captain at U.S. Lines used to tell them, "Just give it to him; he'll take care of it. He'll do it." He even told, "Well, they used to get screwed over by the architects, marine architects, a lot of times." And one day on the pier, he told them, and the architect said, "Well, I can do it." He told them, "You don't do anything." You see him. Whatever he builds, you draw it to me. You send it in. You guys have screwed me enough. How would they? Uh, how, how would the architects screw you? Uh, they would send in plans, and they had the measurements wrong. They had a uh, hatch all set on one of the more McCormick ships to put in forty foot containers, and I was working with them. And you couldn't get a 40 foot container in there. It was 40 foot, and that didn't even count the chafing bars that were on the inside from the cables. So I told them, you can't get them in, you just can't get them and measure them. And then up forward, we had to put a rack to put uh, 20 foot containers on the side of the hatch. And they want to tear down the overhead underneath the shelter deck and weld everything up to support it. Why? Make it on I beams and drop it on the deck and weld it to the deck. Yeah. So he said, do what you want to do. And they used to let me do that. They sent me yeah. a ship, they get hit and they said, okay, how is it? I said, it's okay. We can, it's just a soft roll. You can push it back out. Just by the time we got back, had it all prepared, we pushed it back. It was hard you know? work. I mean, but they let me plates and steel. That was the most fun when they let me Did just you see go. A soft roll, what do you mean? Uh, it wasn't a sharp bend. Okay, gotcha. It was a soft roll gotcha. so that I could push it back out, use it back out. Yeah. But it, you know, I enjoyed the challenges to say, okay, how can we, you know, how can we? Take that, put it in there upside down, backwards. I, I and that was son, my job. My son's a psychiatrist, 
I tell him what I used to do, and he just has no idea what it is. I said, you have no idea what it's like to be on board a ship. Not like this movie Below Deck, you know, he shows a real ship when you're out at the ocean, waves are coming over the top of it, you know? I mean, seriously, dangerous, freezing cold. Still in the ship, we were going down the coast and off Cape Hatteras, on an empty tanker. An empty tanker is brutal because they ride high and they bounce all over the place. And I had all the equipment on the pit and I had guys who were seasick. They couldn't even want to tie everything down. I had to go out and tie everything down. And then uh, they had problems left and right. So I ended up doing nine other jobs except the one that they sent me. Yeah. And my crew was sitting up there green. They couldn't yeah. eat. No matter how so finally you got the Texas really and they said, well, maybe you could do it. I said, I am going home. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, it. Yeah, it was cold, brutal, the summer's job. hot. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, climbing on board a ship up the stream in a winter time, yeah. getting up the launch where you went out, it's like an ice float. But you know, some climb up a Jacob's ladder, swinging around. See how it is right now? Sorry. See how the weather is right now? Yeah. There would be a ship out there, and sometimes you just stay and you look out into the harbor and you liked it. It was like, wow, this is so cool, you know, right? You know, the water's lapping up on the side of the ship. You took a minute out, you're standing there, you're looking around, the seagulls are out there, you know? I used to have a little pocket camera, an Instamatic, and I kept it in my toolbox. And I sometimes I took a few snapshots of guys, you know? I have a couple of pictures of like, off the bow, yeah. off the deck, some of the guys working. I still have a picture of Buddy, my father, Bill, the head of the, the iron workers in the back, Bill Holmes, in the back of the shop, standing around a big target. Target's where you put these, it's a big steel table, and you put pipes on it, and you knock them down. And I just took a picture of these old guys standing there. Old guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's how they treated me. Yeah. I was one of the old times. Yeah. Even though he was young. I was, I was younger than some of them, and I was an old time. Yeah. They called me the kid. Because I had, well, he saw me here before. He hasn't seen me. He yeah. said my father died. How long has it been since you last saw What do you think? When did your father pass? 83. Oh, wow. That's the last time we saw each other. So wow. I had hair down on my shoulder blades, full head of hair, teeth in my mouth. I was 100. My waist was 28 inches, skinny, you know, and young. Yeah. And so that's the last time I saw him. He saw me here, we looked at each other like, <laughs> no. but I didn't name. How come you age? <laughs> yeah. I did. That was an old timer. So, uh, yeah. Oh. Into. Any other questions from the folks there? My grandson. I, no. I was that young one time. Yeah. See, see his build? That's my father and my father in law with the shoulders. I never had that. I had to find ways to make do. And I had to learn how to generate force without these monsters being. When I was swinging the buttons at a sledgehammer, I had to figure out a way to bring the force. And I had to do it with 150 pounds. Yeah, 100, a 20 pound sledgehammer. It was heavy to hold. I swung in that thing on a ship, you know? Any, you can always compensate. And I learned how to compensate. I worked all those things around the clock. Why? Every trick that they taught me, your shoes, steel, no. I want the lightest shoes I can get. We don't wear steel toe shoes. Because number one, if, they, if you're going to get something pressure on steel toe shoes, it's just going to cut your toes off. But I want something light because I'm going to be dragging it around. After about three days, those shoes can get in. So you can learn all the little tricks that you know. It's a guy on the roof looking. You know, save space, save time, save weight. Yeah, containerization changed everything, I think. You know, the it's whole area changed. became more all housing. And people moved in here, and I see little bars and restaurants mm -hmm. now. Well, it wasn't thing. like that then. So now we have these warehouses coming in. 
Yeah. You know, what, what do you think about all that and how that connects with? What are they doing? What they making them like? They make them into a farm. Uh, the, no, the warehouse is like there's the Amazon warehouse. So there are. The, oh, all right. so we've got shipping is still happening in Red Hook. Okay. It's happening in Red Hook again. But yeah. now it's that final mile where they're taking off the trucks, large trucks, and putting okay. on small trucks. Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, they, when I came here, I saw Tesla. They uh, used yeah. to be the old Gulf Marine buildings. They went through a, a long period where there was, wasn't any. Yeah. Because they didn't know what to do with it. They had all of these old warehouses and everything. And it took a while for them to convert. But they knew what they wanted to do with it because my mother told me exactly what they were going to do with you. She was uh, with the political club, Republican club. Community boards and stuff. And she knew that they were going to have the launch coming in and everything. All of these things were planned in advance. But they had to get rid of the people. They dug a trench down Van Brunt Street, and they were going to work on the pipes. And they left an open trench there for like four years. And one building fell down, and somebody got hurt, and the mosquitoes and everything drove the people out. So they got rid of those people. And little by little, they were in a hurry to get rid of the people so they could have the way. I wanted to buy a house down. And it wouldn't sell to us. I lived on 209, and I was going to, instead I ended up buying up on 18th Street because every time they asked about land down here or buildings for sale, suddenly it became known. They wanted to get rid of red hookers. They wanted to. They wanted a different people. I miss being down here. Yeah. And now I live in South Jersey. Yeah. So now it's all a memory, you know? And when we first spoke yeah. on the phone, I was elated. Even further. I was elated. North Carolina. Well, I worked down there in Wilmington. I opened a shop at uh, Jeff Virginia in Wilmington. That's it. And down there, they have a munitions base there where they load them up. So I spent enough time down there, but I'm not going down there. I'm going further up, away from them. Now I want to work on ship repair coming up in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> when I drove here today, I was thinking about all these things down here, you know, the ships, the men, the bars, the string pieces, you know, the terminology of things. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I've thought about it. Two and a half hour ride up here. And I was saying to myself, wow, I wonder how Buddy still looks. You know? I'm alive. Yeah. So they didn't kill me. Yeah. I mean, we're on Facebook together. And every now and then we send somebody, but we don't really have much conversation. We haven't seen each other. Sent an awful lot of people that work for me, younger, older. Yeah. They're all gone. Or they're all like Frankie Deegan. Cancer so bad. Yeah. They're all torn up. Yeah, there's a big gap in the, with the Vietnam War. So, and in the 70s. It's a brutal business. It really is. And it was dying Working down. On ships is It'll beat you up. Well, I, uh, I definitely want to be in touch with you before you take off to North Carolina, and we'll be in touch again yeah, yeah. as well. Okay, soon. thank you very much. And thank you, folks out there in the virtual audience, for joining us, and those of you here as well. Really appreciate your uh, helping us kick off this series of uh, events, and we'll be in touch with you before the spring and summer events that come up uh, with the Township Project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Thank you.